So now we're going to walk through some of the uh, features of the assembly language from the perspective of the language itself rather than the perspective of the machine that will execute it. So we really have these sort of two things that are coming together. We've learned a lot about the machine that we're going to build that will execute MIPS code. And now we're going to learn about some of the specifics of the MIPS uh, assembly language itself. And the first step of that is to walk through sort of a example program. Uh, and the, the example program we usually use is Hello World. So this is a Hello World program that you saw in the lab and in a few other places um, that allows you to just display text to the screen. Now, in C++ or any of the other higher level languages, this is a fairly straightforward thing to do. Uh, you just do, There's a command that prints, and it prints, and you're done. With assembly language, there's a lot of really low-level details that are needed to be able to display something on a console window. In fact, we don't have all of the details that we need because we're going to actually ask the operating system to do some of this for us, which is a little bit cheating, a little bit magic, which is too bad. But you can imagine uh, the operating system code written in assembly that will do all of the stuff, interact with all of the hardware that you need uh, to actually display this kind of information. And in the higher level courses, then you do learn some of the intricacies of input and output that will actually let you display information on a screen or receive information from a keyboard. For now, there's a little bit of magic uh, that uh, where we ask the operating system to do that stuff for us. But let's have a look at this. So we're going to look at a program. This is, again, a sample program from the lab. And we're going to look at it step by step and look at each individual statement and see what it actually translates to in terms of executing operations on the hardware itself. And most of it is actually sort of higher level stuff. Most of it is, is sort of administrative stuff to actually al allow the machine to ask the operating system to display a string. That's all we're doing here. But I wanted to walk through this in detail to show you all the little bits and pieces of the assembler itself and how the assembler takes code that you as a human write and converts it into machine code that the, that the hardware executes. So, um, and again, most of this is what we call boilerplate, uh, which is sort of the same stuff you need for any program that you write. You don't really need to um, write it differently every time. It's gonna be the same every time, which is why we call it the boilerplate. So, for example, at the beginning of every program you write, you're going to have these three lines. .text is an assembler directive. An assembler directive is a special um, code that doesn't actually turn into any uh, instructions on the hardware, but tells the assembler some information about how it wants, how you want it to organize the code. So .text is the beginning of your instruction segment. It's the, the, the instructions that you want to actually execute on the machine, and this is going to go into the instruction memory on the machine. Then you have dot global start and uh, underscore underscore start, uh, and those two are going to say, this is where I want my program to start executing, and essentially what this does is it allows the assembler, when it loads this program onto the computer, to put the address of this first instruction into the program counter, so that the program counter can start executing at the first instruction. So again, this is all boilerplate. We don't really need to worry about it, um, but this is what it does. So dot text starts the text segment, global start, and then the start label. Both of these are going to work together to put the program counter at this first uh, instruction in your code. Uh, when you have something with a colon after it, this is a label. Uh, that the assembler will use to determine the 32-bit memory address of either the text here, the code, or the data uh, as you are just, as you are putting it into memory. So that's what those first three lines do. The next three lines, uh, this is a set of code that is required to ask the operating system to display text for you. So first of all, we're going to load the address of the label string, and that's right here the address of the label string into the register A0. Now, if you've looked at the hardware for MIPS, you already know this is impossible because we can't actually put a 32-bit number into a register in a single instruction. Where does that come from? Right? If we want to put a 32-bit number, a 32-bit address, into a register, it's going to need to have two or three pieces to do that. So, in fact, this is called a pseudo-instruction. It doesn't translate to a real instruction. It translates to a few instructions or a different instruction. But the intent of this one is to load an address into uh, the register A0. And if we look on our page, we'll notice uh, that load address is not one of these instructions. We can load byte, we can load upper, immediate, etc., but we can't load address. And that's because it's not an actual load instruction. Load instructions move information from data 
to a register. Load address is an attempt to put an immediate value into a register. And in fact, we call this a pseudo instruction. And this is our list of pseudo instructions here. And you can see there's a whole bunch of them. One of these here is load address. And we'll see what it translates into. Uh, and we'll look at that in a second. So load address puts the address of the string into A0. Load immediate puts the value 4 into V0. Again, a pseudo instruction, because there is no such thing as load immediate. But instead, what you're doing is you're using another ALU operation that can put the value 4 into V0. We'll see what that translates into. And then syscall is the magical instruction which says, operating system, help us out. Uh, in this case, what it does, syscall is going to look in V0 first and say, what number is in V0? That will tell me what instruction or what, what the um, system request is being made. And again, it's on your sheet. If you look here on the other side of the sheet, we can see it says service. This should say syscall, but these are service requests. And it gives you the number that's stored in V0 and what they are and what the service requests are. So four is print string. We put the number four into register V0. And so that will tell the operating system to print a string. And then it will also check A0 for the address of the string to print because you could print anything. It starts at the first character at that address, which is the H. And then it'll print up until it finds a zero character which is why, and we'll talk about this in a bit more detail later on, we actually call this ASCII Z. So this indicates putting in a ASCII string into memory and zero terminating it so that the system call knows when to end, start printing and when to end. Again, a lot of little fiddly details. Your code will be much simpler than this, but a lot of the stuff that's around the boilerplate is a little bit higher level because it's a bit administrative. Okay, so the system call, this is what there are. Oh, by the way, uh, we call these, um, the, the system call, sorry, the system call looks at V0, but we don't have V0 anywhere in the instruction. We call this an implicit or implied operand. Syscall uses V0 as an operand, but we don't have to say V0 because we always use the same register or registers for that operand. So we call it implied or implicit, it's a way of specifying a register in the opcode itself rather than somewhere in the operands. So the syscall isn't a regular instruction, not a pseudo instruction. And if we look here, we can see syscall is an R format instruction with this opcode and format 000000 for opcode. For a function, go to 001100, and everything else is ignored. So if you send a message or if you uh, ask the computer to execute the instruction specified by zero, C, right? Uh, yeah, zero C, uh, that will be the syscall. Uh, and with these implied, uh, implied operands. Load address and load immediate are again, pseudo instructions. And we can see what they turn into when we actually look at the, um, the sort of display for the simulator that you're using in the lab. And PC spim is what you're using in the lab. I'm starting to use QT spim. There's a lot of SPIM, which are sort of MIPS backwards, they're simulators for MIPS. Uh, and what they do is they take the code and they assemble it for you. And then they pretend to put it onto a computer to execute step by step. And you can see what it actually does. So here we can see load address A0 STR. That's the instruction we actually wrote. But in fact, what gets executed on the computer are these two instructions, LUI and ORI. So we're going to look at that in a bit of detail in a second. Uh, but we can also see li, load immediate, doesn't actually get in implemented as load immediate. It gets implemented as ori, O-R-I. And we'll look at that in a second. Okay? And so, in fact, most of the instructions in this boilerplate example are pseudo-instructions, which is a little bit frustrating, but we can walk through those details and see how they work. On your sheet, pseudo-instructions have a format called P. And in fact, it's even better than that because they're not on the list of instructions at all. So here are the instructions. You don't find any pseudo-instructions there. They're on the other side of the sheet over here in this big list called common pseudo-instructions. The ones we're using today are load immediate and load address. And you'll see how they work. Um, but there are other ones, push and pop for the stack, different kind of branching and things, commonly used pseudo-instructions. Uh, which again get translated into real instructions by the assembler. Load address into A0, the address specified by the 
uh, memory address string gets translated in MIPS into LUI 14097 and ORI410. What the heck is all of this? Where did this come from? Where are these numbers? Well, let's walk through it. So what it's going to be doing is it's actually going to be creating a complete 32-bit number by a clever use of two instructions that can use immediate 16-bit numbers. The first one is called LUI, which is load upper immediate. So what it does is it takes the 16-bit the immediate value and puts it into the top half of a register. It lets the bottom half be zero, and the top half will become whatever you put there. So load upper immediate puts a value in the top half of a register. It uses this opcode, 001111. We don't care about RS. RT is going to be the register we're interacting with, and then the immediate value goes into the top half of that register. The bottom half is all zeros. Okay, so this allows us to create a 32-bit register by first putting the top half in using LOI or LUI and then putting the bottom half in somehow. Well, let's watch how we put the bottom half in. The bottom half is you put in using OR I, which is OR immediate. OR is a bitwise OR, and we already know that the bottom half of this register is all zeros from the load upper immediate, and we can OR a zero with something, we get the something, right? And so whatever immediate value is in the OR instruction gets put, gets ORed with zero, and what we get is the immediate value in the top half from the load upper immediate, and the immediate value in the bottom half from the OR immediate. So this is just a clever way of creating a 32-bit number. If you ever have to create a 32-bit number, you can use load upper immediate and OR immediate, or you can use the pseudo instruction LA, which is load address which is used to load an address into a register, but you can use that to load a 32-bit number if you want to as well. So load up or immediate, and then or immediate, those two things work together. But you need a register to build this in, right? You can't build this in the register that you're using because you're gonna wipe out other information. And so here is our first opportunity to use a special register, a reserved register. And in fact, if you look at this, it's load up or immediate into register one. Well, which one is register one? Register one, is our assembler temporary register. This is a reserved register just for this purpose. It exists only so that the assembler has a register it can use to build temporary values or to do other things that it needs to do. When you're writing pseudo instructions or when you're looking at the other pseudo instructions, you'll find that assembler temporary gets used a bunch. So we're gonna load the top half of the address into register one and then we're going to load the bottom half of the address or, or the bottom half of the address into register four, which is our eventual destination anyway. But what is the address? Well, let's look back at our label here. Here you can see these are the memory addresses that are being used by the assembler. When the assembler makes code, it can go anywhere in memory. It'll pick some place and it'll start going there. This is why the assembler has an important job because until it knows where in memory it's going to go. Uh, we can't say for certain what the address of that string is going to be, right? This is the memory addresses for the for the de, for the instructions or the text, and then these are the memory instructions for the data. So the memory address for the data, and we can see, for example, that the string that we're interested in is going to live at address zero one one zero 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 zero. This is a hex address. I did that wrong. That's not right. If you look at the number, it's actually hex address 10010000. Well, that's the, the address that we want to put into the register so that when it comes time to send that to the operating system, it knows where to look for the string, that address. And we're going to create that address with load up or immediate and then or immediate. This is where this 4097 comes in. What is 4097? Well, um, here, let me see if I can, can I write up here? I cannot, let's do this. 4097 is a base 10 number, right? The address we're looking to create is 0x1001000. That's 32 bits. What are the 32 bits? Well, one is a hex value that means 0001, and then 0000, 0000, 0000, 0000, 0000, 0000, 0000, 0000, 0000, 0000, 0000, 0000, 0000, 0000, 0000, 0000, 0000, 0000, 0000, 0000, 0000, 0000, 0000, 0000, 0000, 0000, 0000, 0000, 0000, 0000, 0000, 0000, 0000, 0000, 0000, 0000, 0000, 0000, 0000, 0000, 0000, 0000, 0000, 0000, 0000, 0000, 0000, 0000, 0000, 0000, 0000, 0000, 0000, 0000, 0000, 0000, 0000, 0000, 0000, 0000, 0000, 0000, 0000, 0000, 0000, 0000, 
binary bits. So this is 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0. This one here, now if we're loading upper immediate, first we're going to put this 16 bits into the top register. This is going to be worth 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, 128, 256, 5, 12, 10, 24, 20, 48, 40, 96. 4096 plus 1 is 4097. That's the number that's going to be put into the upper half of the register that will represent the address of the string because that's where the assembler has decided to put it. Now, this, all this complexity is why we have an assembler in the first place because it's going to put data somewhere in memory and then it's also its job to decide what the address of that data is. So when we say load address of the string into that register, the assembler will do two things. First, it's going to put this data in the memory somewhere, and then it's going to put the address using LUI and LRI into the register that we're interested in. So that's load upper immediate and or immediate. Those two work together to build an address. Um, and this is, again, this is the details of that address. 4097 is that binary number, and we can see all of that together. So the load address pseudo instruction loads an address of a string or something else in your data memory into a register so that you can access it uh, either using syscall or some other reason. When you have variables that are stored in memory, they'll be accessed, pardon me, using load address in the same way. So this is going to be a common thing you're going to end up doing. 